So as you see, I'm a two-lane lifer. Uh, undergrad, four years. Medical school, four years. Uh, I venture to say there were eight of the, some of the eight of the best years of my life being down here. And I enjoy and come back regularly. Uh, I have some CME disclosures. I have a bunch of patents and trademarks. I'm a tinkerer. I'm a little bit of an inventor. And I have, uh, I'm always looking for what might be a little bit better uh, to do with the patients. I'm um, also now with a new hat, which is sort of fun to do when you're my age. I'm a CEO of a med tech startup called Liberty Vision. I'd love to talk to you about that, but that's really complicated. And I'm also in private practice. So most of my work uh, in terms of presenting and research is funded by the Eye Cancer Foundation. However, this talk is uh, endowed by Myrna and John Daniels, to whom I'm uh, greatly appreciative. So this is some of the select things that I've done uh, over the years. And uh, can't talk about all this, but I thought I'd put them up. And if someone finds something that's sort of interesting, they can catch me after the, the presentation. I'd love to talk about any of it. Uh, we're going to talk about these things. And I sort of narrowed it down and narrowed it down to the time. Uh, we'll touch on all these things and make it sort of interesting that way. So cover a lot of ground, and uh, it should be uh, so hopefully it'll be fun. So here's how I started. I was going to be an orthopedist. Decided I didn't like orthopedics and my rotation in orthopedics. And then all of a sudden I had to figure out what I was going to do with my life. Ran around to all the clinics, came to the Tulane uh, ophthalmology clinic, loved it, thought it was wonderful. And then went to the dean. I said, I want to get into ophthalmology. And he said, well, what research have you done? And et cetera, et cetera. And I hadn't, so I went over to Dr. Gordon's lab, and they took me in, and they taught me how to make melanomas in rabbits. And we were doing experiments, and I, this again, you know, this is a while ago, 1980. There's no cell phones, no cameras or anything. So I got to pull something off the internet. But basically what we were doing is what you see on the right, which is an external uh, microwave applicator, except instead of a person, it would be a rabbit who had a tumor in its eye, and we heat up the rabbit. And I got a lot of experience, and I'm eternally grateful. And it got me started, and who knew it at the time? I was just looking to get a residency position. It got me started on, on the path towards ocular tumor. Uh, to show you some of the things that came out of that sort of the concept, I always thought that the external microwaves was too much. The whole eye got heated. And so they were doing this thing called placking. And this fellow over on the left, Sam Packer, invented iodine plaques. And so I said, we must be able to make a microwave antenna to sew on the eye and heat up the tumor. So I went up to RCA in New Jersey, met a guy named Bob Paglione. I said, how long would it take you to make a microwave antenna? I could sew on a bunch of rabbit eyes. He said, I'll get one to you in two weeks. I said, OK. So I went back two weeks later and picked them up. And we arranged to go out to Brookhaven National Lab. And I knew how to make tumors now. And so I made some tumors, and I heated up some tumors. And you can see the thing coming out the middle of it is a thermocouple. So I was actually penetrating the sclera, putting this in the eye, and measuring the temperature as it went into the eye. And then that was a little invasive, especially, you know. So we figured out with phantoms and stuff what that was going to be at distance. And we only had to measure the, the surface. So here we have thermocouples in three places on the surface of the microwave antenna. It's like second generation. Then, of course, I wanted to treat people. And then basically, Sam called me up in residency. I had my residency already. He said, you want to treat people? I said, oh, man, this is going to be a great project. I, I already did it. I know exactly what it looked like in rabbits. And I'm going to treat patients. And so he said, OK, you have to fill out the forms for the FDA, because we're going to have to do this as an investigational device exemption. And so here we have the FDA was and the study treated 48 patients. Combined uh, microwave antenna with radioactive seeds, and it's called thermal radiotherapy because heat really isn't used alone. And wrote a bunch of papers. Patients did great, honestly. Interesting, like I, I think yesterday we talked about there's no new technology without an unintended un side effect. Uh, there were some uh, posterior ciliary closures uh, in a couple of the patients. Uh, little did I know that that ablating all that area that was a uh, tumor and later to develop radiation retinopathy probably decreased the VEGF drive. So those patients did really well. And I still have a bunch of, not a bunch, I have a few in the practice. 
Um, but you can see that 69% of them did 2200 or better, which back in the day was great. And I was able to reduce the radiation dose down to 53 gray, and we had a 94% local control rate. Okay, now here's where science meet, hits the road. I went out to some companies and I said, hey, we've got this technology, I want to get it out there, are you interested? And they said, no. They said, too much liability, too few patients, can't do it. So that was really the end of the experiment. So the next chapter. Still wanted to reduce the radiation dose to normal structures. Uh, this is the history of radiation for in, intraocular radiation. First, Moore put radon seeds in the eye and killed tumors. Then Stallard and Lomatch uh, created solid disk plaques. Stallards were made out of cobalt-60. Lomatch was ruthenium-106. One, uh, and then that generation you know, went through and did a lot of good work. But it's very high energy stuff. As a matter of fact, you had to be in isolation in a room because some of the, the energy was so high it would go through walls. So Packer, Rotman, and separately Seeley in South Africa came up with iodine plaques. Uh, Dr. Rotman's a radiation oncologist. Uh, and then that what became the standard of care, mostly because the collaborative ocular melanoma study adopted iodine plaques as their therapeutic arm and they, because the people there realized the advantages of it. And then 1991, I found palladium-103 to come out, and it had its own advantages over iodine. So I was training with Sam Packer, so I seen all the results of the iodine patients. I knew exactly what, was, what to expect, and so sort of in a unique position to see what changes might occur if we use palladium instead. But Sam used to say something that was, Sam used to say a lot of things that were really, really uh, prescient. He said, you know, large clinical trials won't change physics. That was one of the things he likes to say. So, and he's right. Uh, this is the dose distribution over, over uh, distance. Uh, the dotted line is palladium, and the solid line is iodine. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what you see here is three centimeters. So three centimeters is about the eye. So for the first 0.5 to one, they're very, very similar and then it drop, palladium drops off a lot. So what does that mean to me? That means I can put the radiation in the tumor, but once the radiation leaves the tumor, it drops off much faster than iodine, which means the rest of the eye is getting less radiation. And it depends on where the tumor is. It could be the fovea is getting less radiation, or maybe just the whole eye is getting less radiation, the lens. It really depends on where the tumor is in the eye. And you can see that I've written about 36 patient papers on that over the years. And there's this guy here, Darius Moshvegi, which is a story in itself. Many of you guys know Darius, he's a great guy. He's at Stanford now. And uh, we did a lot of the initial uh, work uh, with dosimetry and palladium together. This, I throw this in, this is a clinical photograph. Most people don't see plaques, they don't see that many melanomas even. But this is a uh, melanoma and then two years later treated with a palladium plaque. One thing you might wanna notice, the tumor got darker and shrunken and there's also this atrophy around the edges. We always treat two to three millimeters beyond the tumor as a safety zone. And this is chorioretinal atrophy, and I can tell you this got about 200 centigrade, or 250. And then I wrote this paper in 2009. It was really the last clinical paper, I guess I'm sort of due. And, uh, but this compared it to other series at the time. And we just did great, you know, 79% were better than 2200. Again, that was really good at the time. Uh, and it was like pre-anti-VEGF. And then our, our local control rates were, were really high. And our, uh, let's see, recurrence rates, 3%, 97%. Neovascular glaucomas, very low, 2.5%. And so patients did really well with palladium. So, Okay, so I haven't really switched off palladium and they don't really make a lot of new radionuclides uh, anymore. Uh, that's another story. But there were some things I wanted to do with the palladium to treat special tumors and maybe change the way we treat some tumors. So I developed this thing called a Bart's plaque. Some people think it looks like Bart Simpson. <laughs> it's also a little bit of a tribute to St. Bart's in London where the first plaques were used. And then uh, this is a Barrett's plaque. I'm not sure, maybe Matt can tell us, but I got this from Barrett Hike, and it's 
basically I have 22 and 24 millimeter plaques and they're for the people, it used to be for the people who didn't want to have an enucleation, but now very few people even get an enucleation. I think we're down to 5% or so. And then there's this one called finger slotted plaques and this is really the subject of the next couple slides. So one of the problems with treating melanomas that are near touching or covering the optic nerve is you can't get near them with a round plaque. And we, we used these things called notch plaques, which were really dysfunctional. They had a, basically a four millimeter cutout based on the two millimeter disc size. But we know, and we did some experiments on this, measuring orbital optic nerve sheath diameters that it, the actual optic nerve sheath is much bigger than the optic disc. So even if you had a, a plaque right up against the optic nerve sheath, you're pretty much guaranteed to miss the last millimeter and a half of a melanoma that's touching the disc. So what we had to do is actually make a hole in the plaque that's big enough to accommodate the optic nerve sheath. And, that, and from ultrasound experiments, 3D ultrasound experiments, we, figured, we found in treating, you know, measuring a lot of people, that that was about six millimeters, the average optic nerve sheath. And if we made an eight millimeter slot in the plaque, I could actually slide the optic nerve into the plaque and move the seeds to a way that they're completely covering the tumor. And so these are 3D ultrasound. Uh, I wish I had this back. This is another technology that sort of came and went. But you can see in, uh, in this, you can, see, you can see the plaque here. There's the optic nerve sheath. And, the, and here, to the plaque around the optic nerve. And, and uh, in a, uh, that's an AP longitudinal. And what you have to, the, the leap of faith is that it's not the gold that, that radiates the tumor, it's the seeds. And as long as you can get the seeds on the other side of the tumor, you create a three-dimensional field that encompasses the entire tumor. So we took our local control rates of about 80% selecting out only tumors that touched about 90 degrees of the disc to 98.2%, including tumors that completely covered and obscured the disc. Okay, the second thing, sort of the other end of the, of the eye, is I was never really hot, happy with ir, you know, iridectomies. Um, I, you know, they left these huge gaping things that there was poor pupillary function afterwards sometimes. I really don't see much diplopia, but a lot of glare. And there's also the risks of interocular surgery. And sometimes they're pretty big, you know, surgeries. So back in, in uh, before 2001, the mid-90s, I started uh, placking uh, iris tumors. And that was sort of another thing. Well, what's going to happen to the cornea if we put a plaque on the cornea? But it's, sort of, it's really interesting that endothelial cells don't divide, right? So they really shouldn't be affected by radiation much at all. And the cornea, like the sclera, is extremely radio resistant. And the epithelium typically just grows back. And so they do really, really well. And so now we've, we recently published uh, in 2017 on regression patterns, but it has a lot of information there. And uh, here's a, a case that's 10 years after plaque. And this is, would have been a pretty big resection and patient's cornea is clear, and here we go. In case you haven't seen a plaque, I thought I'd put this in too, but it has to run. There we go. So here you're doing a conjunctival pyridomy, opening up tenons in all four quadrants, a little hemostasis. You see a mark where the tumor is? That's the, just the edge of the tumor, the rest is in the ciliary body. The uh, Bart's plaque gets put on the, that quadrant, sewn in with five ovicrals. And, you know, if, just think about this. This is, uh, this is pretty painful to have a piece of gold sewn to your cornea, though. And so the first bunch of years, it was, I tried to make the plaques as quick as possible in terms of days, usually five days. I had to give people pain medicine and stuff like that. But then, um, actually, it was a detail guy who came into the OR and said, Dr. Finger, can you use these amniotic membranes for anything? So sure enough, I started taking these amniotic membranes off, putting them on the cornea, 
sliding them underneath the plaque. And they're like perfect for radiation oncology because they're tissue. So there's no question of having them block radiation. And they're about 0.1 millimeters thick. And so that it didn't even have to change the computations. And it buffers the cornea and makes the patient, because patient pain was like nine, eight or nine, and it's now one or two uh, using this uh, buffer technique. I'll just move on. You guys don't need to see a, a flap unless you want to see a flap. It's basically a Gunderson flap goes over the top and then uh, injection of medicines. So uh, the other thing that was sort of interesting about these iris tumors is that unlike most of the melanomas, no one developed any retinopathy. So I had my fellow at the time, Dr. Youssef, write a paper on that. That was 2011. And I can tell you, it's, even as of today, we have yet to see one patient with radiation retinopathy. And that's because the distance between the cornea and the macula so far that the dose to the macula and optic nerve are really small. We have had one corneal opacity, and that's why I didn't mention it before. And interestingly, and if someone can explain to me why, it was in a PK. So you can see the edge of the plaque on the PK, but you can't see it on the, on the normal uh, patient's residual cornea. So it just has a half a moon on the PK. And I don't know why. Uh, almost everybody gets a cataract if they're phagic. The radiation dose to the lens is quite high. But who does get radiation retinopathy and optic neuropathy? It's these folks, people with tumors in the back of the eye. And so I did do an analysis of that, and this is the graphic from that paper, where you can see the radiation posteriorly is higher than it is anteriorly. It's just location, location, location. Uh, the pathophysiology of radiation retinopathy is typically early vascular incompetence, uh, which leads to edema. Things that contribute to edema are shunt vessels and neovascularization. Edema leads to vision loss, and everything the, like the last common pathway is late vascular closure, which is irreversible. So back in 2006, I s discovered that my, f my friends, the retinal friends, were all treating macular degeneration with anti-VEGF, and I started using anti-VEGF for radiation vasculopathy. Almost fell out of my chair the first few patients I saw, and I got a patent on that and wrote a couple of papers in the archives in AJO, one on, on retinopathy and one on optic neuropathy. Here's a, a, one of the clinical, early clinical examples. You can see the tumor. You can see cotton wool spots and hemorrhages. And then eight, eight months later, it's with monthly injections, it uh, cleared up. The patient uh, has 2025 vision. Back in the day before we had a treatment for radiation maculopathy, they, eight months later, they'd probably been 2,200. Uh, this was the first case treated for radiation uh, papillitis or anterior optic neuropathy. And you can see the, the time frame there. Uh, this was initially the edema and hemorrhages uh, sort of whitened up at a week. Definitely different. I was impressed. Six weeks later, you're starting to see the disc again. Three months later, patients 2020 with the reformed disc edges. And then now eight years later, actually, unfortunately, she moved to Florida. I don't get notes, but eight years after that, she was like this, 2025. And in general, the radiation optic neuropathies do quite well, especially if you catch them early. So what about long term? So I presented this, as you might imagine, I started doing this, I started presenting it all over. The question came out, what happens long term? You know, since 2016, I mean 2006, now I have almost 20, 15 years follow up. So I did write this paper in 2016, and uh, what we found was that 80% at the 10-year at at the mark, 80% were within two lines of their pre-irradiation visual acuity. Um, I found that people generally needed more and more medication to stay stable, um, which is sort of like hypertension and diabetes and other diseases. I think we get spoiled with infectious disease that so we actually cure them. But I think radiation maculopathy is a progressive chronic disease. And so it's sort of the opposite of a treat and extend, though even a lot of the patients that go back to the retina guys, I, they come back and someone tried to extend them and I have to put them back on track. So in conclusion, um, Palladium 103 offered 
the best reported local control, visual acuity and eye retention. And the reason why I say that is another sort of experiment I'm doing, which is really odd. I'm actually tracking every patient that comes back to the waiting room, and we're averaging their result in with every other patient that comes back to the waiting room, and getting almost real-time results, which is actually very interesting and educational for me. Uh, iris melanomas can be treated uh, without significant corneal opacity, retinopathy, or optic neuropathy, but most of them get cataracts. And this finger slotted plaque normalizes plaque position and improves local control. And anti-VEGF therapy works for radiation vasculopathy and also optic neuropathy and also radiation-associated neovascularization of the iris, which I didn't talk about. Thank you very much. I want to take a moment to thank you for your attention and to thank the Eye Cancer Foundation who supported much of the research presented in this lecture and for their committed support for international multicenter cooperation in ophthalmic oncology. Thank you and have a nice day.